Before I begin, if I could ask everyone to please recite one Surat al Mubarakat al Fatiha. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المذلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي مولاي وابن مولاي أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة العمى يا غريب يا مذنوم يا أتشان كربلا ما خاب من تمسك بكم ولا من من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا ماكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق والأستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأحليكم نارا وقودها الناس والهجارة عمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد this verse that I began with in chapter 66, verse number 6 of the whole of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the believer as he commands us, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who believe, Qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. He says, save yourselves and save your children from eternal punishment. And other ayat of the whole of the Qur'an, they speak to the fact that our wealth and our children or a test or a trial for us. The idea is that as much as our wealth, as much as our children, as much as all of the blessings that we receive are a unique blessing from Allah Azza wa Jal, at the same time, God tries us by means of the blessings that he has given us to see how we will interact with them and how we will deal with them. And like we know that there's probably not a lot of challenges in life that are similar toward raising children. In fact, if you go toward the lives of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as God presents within the whole Quran, we see the obstacles of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam and his son. We see the obstacles of Luqman and the interaction that he has with his children. Similarly, we consistently are witness to the fact that throughout history, there can undoubtedly be children who come from the lines of believers, but at the same time, they don't necessarily have that same conviction, nor that same belief, and also vice versa. Whereby you see children who turn out to be mu'mineen and mu'minat, staunch in their conviction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the authority of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but their parents may not believe. Nonetheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he commands us to at the very least make a sincere effort in striving to being amongst those who cultivate children, who learn from this faith and have convictions in God, in the whole Quran, in the prophethood of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And of course, most importantly, live a life of morality, live a life of ethics, live a life of virtue, so on and so forth. Which is why in the famous hadith from Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salam, he states, Min walad ala abihi. We often talk about the rights of the parents over the children. Yet in this particular hadith, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he talks about the rights of the children over the parent, and specifically over the father. Min walad ala abihi an yuhsina ismuh wa an yuhsina ta'limuh wa an yuzawijuhu idha dhalikh. The Imam alayhi salam states, and it is from amongst the rights of the child over his father, Number one, that the parent gives the child a good name, to give them a good name, to give them a name of one of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or one of the names of the imams of Ahlul Bayt, or one of the names of 
those who come from the holy household uh, of Ahl al-Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them. And number two, the Imam uh, alayhi salam, he states, وَأَنْ يُحْسِنَ تَعْلِيمُ The second right of the child over the parent is that the parent teaches the child good etiquette, naturally. We strive to do the best that we can toward imparting an etiquette, morality, virtue, like we spoke about before, to our children. And it's a responsibility and obligation upon the parents to do so. And thirdly, And thirdly, to get one's child married when they attain the ability to do so physically, when they attain age, to get married. And like we know within the religion of Islam as well, there's so much a stress in regards to family building, in regards to having children. In fact, if you go ahead and take a look at our du'as, you see so many a supplication narrated from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them, that for instance, talk about a supplication or a du'a to be recited at the moment of conceiving a child. At the moment, for instance, when the child has reached three months, throughout the pregnancy of the mother of that child a supplication or ayat of the whole Qur'an to be recited at the moment of delivery, and so on and so forth. Again, in the idea that a child is brought up in the environment of the Qur'an, in the environment of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this for today's discussion, insha'Allah ta'ala, I want to reflect upon a really important question that sort of sparks up in many of our households, and specific with regards to how we speak to our children about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's easy, for instance, perhaps to impart wisdom, to impart morality, to impart values like that of compassion and generosity to our children if we ourselves uphold those same values. Of course, that itself is difficult and challenging in and of itself, but if we're a people of virtue, naturally our children, they will follow suit. But it's awfully difficult and challenging for most people to talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creation of God as the creator to our children. Because like we know, kids, our intellects, they begin to develop once we attain the age of puberty. But prior to that, it goes through its own unique phases and obstacles and challenges and experiences. And everything that a child sees and everything that a child experiences, it's etched into their memory, which is why we will oftentimes remember certain sort of profound and formative experiences during the course of our lives, even though we might have only been three or four years old. If something really significant and important happens in our household from when we're really young, there's a good opportunity that we'll remember it 30 or 40 years down the road. And this the idea is to create memories and to create experiences for our children, whereby they're able to grow up in the climate of the remembrance and in the knowledge and in the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for today's discussion, insha'Allah ta'ala, I wanna pose the question of how do I teach my child about God? And I wanna reflect upon this question in three different dimensions. The first dimension is in terms of understanding the levels in terms of how children learn. Secondly, a couple of bad methods that we often employ in terms of engaging or teaching our children. And thirdly, and finally, some hopefully practical steps in terms of how we can teach our children about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's get into dimension number one. And that's specifically in terms of understanding the levels whereby a child develops this ability to know, or in other words, how does a child learn? I don't claim to be a psychologist, nor a biologist, nor a neurologist. And I can't speak to the fact of how the brain develops during the early course of a child's life. But nonetheless, development of a young child, especially again during those early years between the day of his or her birth until approximately six or seven years old, there are a couple of different common themes and experiences that all children encounter and deal with. And many of these are also pointed to and referenced within the teachings and the ahadith of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad. And so I wanna run through a couple of these different levels in terms of how a child learns in order that we're able to answer these really important and profound questions about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they ask us. 
The first point to note is the fact that a child at a very young age learns via observation. Like we know, a child at a very young age is looking out for their parents' faces, looking out to see how they act or how they respond to certain things. When you get angry, a child knows that it has to be fearful. When you get happy, the child might, for instance, make the same face or make this, might make the same sound in order to get that same re reaction because it feels the presence of his or her mother or father or uncle or aunt or friend or whoever else is in that particular household. And children, oftentimes, they listen for sounds. And again, they listen for responses. So they will start hearing their own voices and they will start calling out when they need something, when they need to drink milk, when they need to drink water, when they need to eat food, when they wake up from their sleep, they wake up often crying because they want to demonstrate that they have a need. And the way that they recognize that their parent is going to come to their support is by making a sound. Because the minute that a child starts to cry, the minute that the child begins to scream, the parents run into the room to make sure that their child is doing okay. As that child becomes a little bit older, they start to explore and they observe by, for instance, shaking toys or playing with toys or banging them against the wall because again, they like that sound and they wanna observe slowly what happens and what takes place at the moment of their movement and so on and so forth. So it's really important to understand that a child, especially in those very first months of life, maybe that up to that first year, understands and learns and builds in their own knowledge, in the ma'rafa that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them the ability to be receptive to by means of observing that which is around them. As the child gets older, it begins to play, or what we consider to be play. Ch children, of course, they love toys. If I were to pivot my camera to the left or to the right or behind me, you're going to see toys all around. Why? Because children, again, they enjoy playing. And through our lens, we believe that the children or that the child just enjoys being playful because children themselves are just playful. But in reality, as many psychologists, they demonstrate that when a child is playful, that's actually their means of seeking knowledge. When a child is playing with a toy, when a child is breaking a toy, when a child is smashing something against the wall, we might not appreciate that. But at the end of the day, that's their method toward uncovering some sense of truth because they're seeking some sense of knowledge. We ourselves seek knowledge in many different ways. But many a times, our door and our capacity to seek knowledge was closed at a very young age. Maybe because we weren't given that much opportunity to play, for instance. If you take a look, for instance, you go to the mosque or even in your own household, and I'm guilty of this perhaps more than anyone else, that if our children are awfully playful, sometimes we think, man, like, what wrong did I do with my child? My child really is shaitan by the way that they're running across, they're breaking things, they're so loud, or they're so disruptive, and they're so annoying, and so on and so forth. That's not the case. And sometimes when you take a look at a child who's sitting quietly and so well behaved, we think, oh, man, this child, this is exactly the type of child that I wish that I gave birth to. But in reality, again, every child develops and grows differently. Just one quick anecdote. My nephew, a couple of days ago, he was in Majlis for a month, saying, salam, not mine. Nonetheless, I forgive them. They were sitting in a Majlis for a month, Hussein, and the Sheikh was giving the lecture. And he mentioned that we need, we as a community, need to shake it up when it comes to our akhlaq, meaning that we need to start making sure that we're becoming a little bit more merciful, a little bit more compassionate. My nephew, who's approximately three years old, he got up in the middle of the Majlis, started dancing. And everyone's like, what's going on over here? He heard shake it up and he thought that he should be dancing. Of course, we as parents, community, elders are gonna be like, what's going on with this child? Again, what's wrong with him? But at that innate nature of the child is to play, is to move. And it understands itself and it understands its environment via methods of play. And that brings me then to the third method when children become older, by which they're able to seek knowledge and learn. And that is again, via experience and making connections. Simple example, that oftentimes a child at a very young age, two, three, four years old, is of course attached to their mother. 
is of course attached to their father, but undoubtedly their mother marks it. And the minute that their mother begins to get ready to leave the home, even if they haven't said anything about them going out, they see the way that their mother dresses and they know that they're going to leave. And the child begins to cry. The child begins to scream. Even at a very young age, when they're only a couple of months old, the mom wears hijab, is about to exit the door, and all of a sudden, the screaming. Why? Because they know that just by the way that their child, that just by the way that their mother, or just by the way that their father, just by the way that their friend has dressed, that in a little while they're no longer going to be in their presence. And emotionally, their state gets sort of turned upside down. Similarly, a child is built by routine. When you want to teach a child to sleep adequately, appropriately, you begin by shutting off the lights. You begin by creating some sense of routine, taking them to the restroom, brushing their teeth, whatever it might be. And the minute that something like daylight savings takes place and the sun is out a little bit longer than it was before, the child doesn't want to go to sleep. Why? Because it says, look, there's light outside. Because again, we associate from a very young age experiences and routine and symbolism to the way that we learn, the way that we develop, the way that we understand certain things. In a fourth stage, when a child becomes of a certain age, maybe four and above, the child begins to associate and seek knowledge by means of language. From a very, very young age, before it's able to speak and code via the language that you and I collectively we speak, they come up with their own terms, their own term for milk, their own term for water, their own term for using the bathroom, their own term for sleeping, oftentimes their own term for mother or for father or for whatever. But as they get older, they're able to pick and choose the appropriate language to identify, for instance, what is water or what is milk or what is phone because of repetition, because of hearing that from their parents. Again, I say all of this not to give you all a lesson in parenting, because at the end of the day, I need that more than anyone else, but really in order for us to understand a common thread amongst every single one of these four patterns of seeking knowledge of a child from a very young age. And that is that every single one of them have to deal with physical forms or have to deal with things that can be understood via a child's senses. They play and they touch and they taste, and they see. Again, all of these are in regards to the five senses of the human being. When it comes toward questions like that about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can we engage our children in terms of teaching them how they can understand God when we know, of course, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be understood by any of these five senses. Laysa kamithlihi shay that there is nothing like him, like him. He cannot be seen, nor can he be heard, nor can he be tasted, nor can he be smelt, nor can he be touched. Yet over here, we perhaps run into a problem. Because many a time, immediately, the parent is more inclined toward getting the child to understand the problem of their question. For instance, who created Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You ask your child, who created you? And your child says, Allah, because you taught them. But the next question that they might ask is, then who created Allah? And then what are we going to do? We're stuck. If we don't answer the question appropriately, or if we seek toward dismissing their question, or we seek toward explaining it to them in a way that goes beyond the physical senses that they're understanding. Of course, these questions have to be answered in a way whereby the child is able to have the capacity to understand. And they're probably not going to be asking these questions at age two or three anyway, but at a later age. So it's about getting them to a state whereby they're able to be receptive. We'll get into that in just a moment. And this brings me then toward the second dimension of my discussion with regards to a couple of problematic methods in terms of the way that we engage or teach our children. And let me just say this again in one quick parenthesis. And that is that, like I said, it's awfully difficult to raise children. And it's awfully difficult to are teaching them how to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm not claiming to be any expert. I'm claiming to be someone who is learning and hopefully we're able to sort of share in this process so that we're able to cultivate a 
environment of God conscious children, inshallah ta'ala. So what are some of these bad methods that are often employed within our households, within our communities, with regards to teaching our children? Number one is of course, by ignoring their questions entirely. Eventually a child gets to a state whereby they're consistently asking why questions. Why is the sky blue? Why are you wearing black? Why is my skin this color? Why did you buy this and not that? Why is, why is anything and everything and everything that they have to speak to, every thought that comes to their mind, they always jump to why. Why do we have to do it like this? Why don't they do it like this? So on and so forth. Why questions? for a child, again, are innate. Every single one of us during the course of our lives have been there. Well, we have asked our parents, we've asked those around us these questions numerous times. And like Socrates famously states, a life that is not questioned is not worth living. The idea is that in life, we consistently from a very young age ask these why questions, but that door gets shut really, really quickly because oftentimes we're the one shutting it for our children, because we ourselves didn't have that opportunity to ask ourselves. And in a famous quote also from Picasso, the famous artist, who says, every child is an artist, but the problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. Again, we have that curiosity from a really young age, but by culture and by society, again, we're forced to retreat and keep that curiosity to ourselves. And as a famous child psychologist states, every child is a philosopher until we lock them up in the prison of non-questioning. Again, and so again, sort of the teachings of the Prophet and his family, والسلام, which actually encourage this idea of seeking evidences to everything. If you go ahead and take a look at a book like Kitab al-Kafi of Al-Kulaini, whereby he narrates all of these a hadith of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam. You open up the first chapter, the book of intellect and the book of Tawheed thereafter. And you're going to see that the narrations that are presented, so many of them are these conversations that Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam has with many atheists during his day in the holy city of Medina. And whenever he would go for Hajj in Mecca, he would interact with them. He wouldn't get angry. He wouldn't reject their questions. In fact, he would sit with them for hours upon hours, answering and answering and answering those questions to the extent that he trained some of his companions, like individuals like that of Hisham bin Hakam, to go and speak toward these points and toward these realities and to converse again with individuals who didn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, not in a way that only engaged polemics, but in a way whereby they really sincerely wanted to impart wisdom upon those who were seeking knowledge. And yet for our children, it's so easy for us to completely ignore their questions or to pivot away from them or to not answer them or so on and so forth. So number one, the biggest problem or amongst the biggest problems or methods that we often employ in terms of engaging our children is by ignoring their questions entirely. A second sort of poor method in terms of engaging our children is answering them, but not answering them adequately. We often like to sort of run away from these questions. And again, how many of us have ever thought of the questions that our children ask? A child, for instance, will come to their parent and not only ask them who created Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because it's a question that we may have all asked, but they'll ask questions like, where is Allah? Where is God? And we can come up with really nice, eloquent answers, like maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in our heart or for whatever reason that we often state that, for instance, Allah is everywhere. I remember one child, when they were told that Allah is everywhere, they asked it also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the toilet. So every time the toilet flushes, part of Allah also goes in there. So again, it's problematic that we explain to our kids, again, in ways that we think that might make sense, but oftentimes they're a lot more creative and a lot more clever than many of us. So it's important, again, that we find the answers and that we dig deep down towards seeking appropriate answers in terms of engaging our children. Because if we're giving them answers that are not adequate, if we're giving them poor answers and they're not satisfied by those answers, where are they going to go? 
eventually they're going to get to an age where they have a smartphone in front of them and they're going to look it up online and they're going to find something far different than what we told them. So make sure that when they ask, we're ready to answer. And that requires a little bit of homework and that requires a little bit of effort. And that brings me then to problem number three. And that is, in addition to ignoring their questions entirely and answering them poorly, a third bad method that we often employ in terms of our engagement with our children's questions, specifically about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or about religion, is that we may get angry. You may get angry. Your child comes to you again and says, who created me? Where did I come from? They say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. Then they say again, who created Allah? And you tell them, what's wrong with you? How dare you ask such a question? How does that make any sense? That child, it's innate for them to seek knowledge. Again, like we mentioned before, it's part of their fitr. They have this goal and this hope in terms of finding answers to their questions. It's important, again, that we don't get angry, that we don't put our own emotion into it. We don't reflect upon experiences that we might have had when we were children. No. The minute that we get angry, they're going to feel that, again, they can never ask these questions. And again, that might lead them to completely dismissing this religion entirely. Like we said before, Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wasalam, they would open up their hearts to people. And that brings me then to problem number four. And that is, again, giving wrong answers entirely. Giving wrong answers entirely. Let me put it sort of in a little bit of context. All the time, all the time, People, they come, they send me email. They say, Sheikh, a question for you. They say, like we talked about a couple of nights ago, can you interpret this dream for me? Or they say, I have this problem. Can you give me some dua so that this problem goes away? I'm not really good at these things. So I'll tell them, I'm sorry, I don't interpret dreams. And I don't know exactly how to answer your problem. But then there are other people who, for instance, might claim to have all of the knowledge of the unseen, so every single time they're asked a question, they give a response. Someone has a problem with their marriage. They have a problem with their children. They have a problem with wealth. They have a problem with an illness. Like a couple of you know, months back in the beginning of the pandemic, people started spreading all of these sort of du'as on WhatsApp. For instance, saying you read this du'a and you'll see that no COVID will enter into your home. All of a sudden, what happens? COVID enters into their home. People get ill. Even people pass away. They lose their jobs, so on and so forth. And then they say, who's the one who sent this forward? It came from this sheikh living in this part of the world and you know, so on and so forth. People, they begin to dismiss the religion entirely. They begin to look at all of this as a big joke. When you don't know something, say, I don't know. Or seek toward finding that answer more broadly. But when it comes to our children, the most important people in our lives, and when they ask us a question, make sure that we're striving toward giving them the right answer. And if we don't know the right answer, because again, if we give them the wrong answer, they are going to dismiss everything that we taught them prior to that moment as well. Retroactively, 10, 15 years from now, they're going to know that my parent lied to me. They didn't even know the answer to the question, but they claimed to know it. If we literally, genuinely, sincerely don't know, tell your child, why don't we all sort of figure this out together and have that conversation? And look it up online, spend the night reading. So you can go back toward, again, adequately answering your children's questions. And then this finally brings me to the third dimension of our discussion, inshallah. And that is specifically with how we teach our children about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before we get there, a couple of important prerequisites with regards to a couple of questions that are often posed. Number one, that when our children ask us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, number one, validate the importance of the question to your child. Your child is five years old, and they come to you and they say, Mom, Dad, who created Allah? How come I can't see Allah? How can Allah see us in the darkness of the night? Allah is one. How can he see seven and a half billion people all across the world? How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hear my du'a and hear your du'a and hear my sister's du'a and hear my brother's du'a all at the same time? Won't they get confused? These are all valid questions that children have. When they ask these questions, validate them. Say, you know what? That's a really good question. 
That's a really important question. That's number one. Second, number two, an important step that we have to take when our children ask us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to make sure that we praise them. We praise them for asking that question. Number one, you demonstrate how important the question is. So again, it doesn't leave their mind. Number two, you praise them for asking such an incredible question, even if you're hesitating and thinking and postponing about how you're going to answer that question. Tell them, mashallah, it's an amazing question that you asked. You're so intelligent. You're so smart. So they feel courageous. They feel like they did the right thing. Because again, when you slam them for asking a question that might, for our, on, in terms of our lens, be you know, satanic, or we might see it like some, some sort of shirk that our child is bringing up in the household. No. They're seeking knowledge. They're seeking an answer to an innate question that has popped up in their soul. So praise them for it and respect them for it. Again, so they feel that courage and that bravery to ask questions thereafter. And thirdly, with regards to how we deal with our children ethically when it comes to them asking questions, make sure that we speak to them according to their intellect. We mentioned this hadith on a previous night. Let's speak to our children in a level that they understand. If you're a professor of philosophy, you can't talk to your children and prove to them the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through philosophical terminology. If you're a theologian, you can't speak to your child and explain to them about how to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through classical terms within Islamic theology or otherwise. Rather explain to our children in ways that they can understand. And again, no one knows our children better than we do. So I'll give you a couple of glimpses in regards to how we can potentially answer some questions. And certainly they may have their holes, but nonetheless, there is some important language within these questions that our children ask and how we should respond to them. Let me give you example number one. Your child comes to you and says, Mama, Baba, where is Allah? Where is Allah? How come I cannot see Allah? I see the trees and I see the moon and I see the stars and I see the oceans and I see the rivers, so on and so forth. I can see your eyes and I can see your face. I can see the face of my grandparents, but how come I cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Does Allah really exist because I can't see him? All sort of common language that is often thrown around by children. Amongst the ways that you can get them to understand is number one, demonstrate to your child, for instance, that air exists, that gravity exists. Right now it's pretty hot outside. The air condition is on or turn on the fan in your home. Again, utilize physical things because that's the way that children understand. So you turn on the fan and you ask your child, do you feel the air? And you feel the air. They say, can you touch the air? Can you taste the air? Can you smell the air with any of your five senses? They're going to say no. You tell them that in the same way that air exists and you can't see it, there can also be other things that exist. Doesn't mean you have to see all of them. From a very young age, from children in pre-K, they learn about gravity. That if they went up into the if they went up into space, they would be floating. But this glass of water, for instance, rests on this table very comfortably. It's not spilling everywhere because of gravity. Where's gravity? Can you see gravity? Can you touch gravity? Can you taste gravity? Okay. In the same way that gravity exists, but you cannot see it, there are also other things that exist that you may or may not be able to see. Someone says, for instance, a child, for instance, they ask, they say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his face, where are his hands? Where are his legs? Immediately, if we jump to saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does not have a how, nor does he have a where, nor does he have, they're not going to understand. So again, bring them along slowly. So your child asks you, for instance, where is Allah's house? Where is Allah's hands? We respond by telling them that we need all of these things because we're weak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strong. 
We need eyes because we're weak. We need a house because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stronger than all of that. He doesn't need these sorts of things. These are a couple of sort of ways that you can explain to your child. For instance, you can tell them that, who do you love? What is important to a child except their love for their parents, except for their love for their toys, except for their love for their home or for their milk or for other tangible things? You tell them, can you show me love? Can you show me that you love your mom? They're going to say, I can give them a hug. But that's not what love is. Love is not in a hug, nor is love in a kiss, nor is love in an expression of stating, I love you. But love is something, again, that you feel, but not something that you feel with the hands, not something that you feel with sight. No, it's again, something innate. It's something that you can feel its presence through this sort of unique way. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we be the best that we possibly can be by means of our etiquette, by means of our ethics, by means of our relationship with him, we can also feel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that way. Okay, another question. Your child comes to you and says, who created us? Like we talked about before, what do we say to them? We say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. And that moment when they ask that question, who created Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do you respond? Again, try to bring them the example closer by speaking to them via examples of physical and tangible things. You ask them who created the watch that I'm wearing, who created this glass, who created this table, who created the door, who created this chair, who created the computer. And they're gonna keep, they're gonna say, for instance, the one who created the door is the worker. And then you ask them, and who created the worker? Until you draw them back slowly and slowly to a point of zero, whereby they don't have an answer anymore other than the fact that they say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until you can explain to them that for all of these things, there needs to be a creator. And that we ourselves are a creation and there has to be a creator to all of this creation. There has to be a cause to all of this effect. Again, there are ways based on our child's age, based on their experiences, based on the type of questions and where they might be and where they're coming from and what experience drew them toward asking these questions that might differ in terms of the way that we explain it to them. But it's important for us to note this point, that once a child is of a certain age, whereby they have the intellectual capacity to perhaps understand with a little bit more depth, you can explain to them and tell them, for instance, look at your eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created these eyes and you're able to see so many things. You're able to see so many colors, but your eyes are limited, aren't they? I can only see a certain distance. I can't see right now what's happening in the holy city of Karbala. Right now I can, if I turn on the internet, turn on a link, maybe I can, they might respond to you. Then you tell them, can you tell me what that person is wearing on his shirt? Eventually, they're going to come to a conclusion to understand that our eyes are limited, our ears as well. Our ears can hear really well, alhamdulillah. But our ears, how much can they hear? Right now, I can't hear anything other than that's what's taking place within the four walls of my home. If I turn on something on my phone, for instance, maybe I can hear that which is happening in the other side of the world. But then I can't hear anything that's happening in the four walls, so on and so forth. The idea is that we have limitations. And in the same way that our physical senses have these limitations, our intellects, our rationale also has certain limitations. And amongst those limitations is when it comes toward understanding some matters about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, when they're at the stage, when they've reached that level and so on. Again, I say all of this because it's important that we strive, that we do our best, that we're as sincere as possible toward understanding toward reflecting, toward thinking about where our children are coming from when they ask such questions so that we can answer them, answer them to the best of our ability because one wrong misstep that we make in their youth can lead to detriment many decades down the road. And that leads me then, especially on this night as we're talking about children and about how we cultivate our children and specifically Questions that children may pose toward the remembrance of one of those children of Karbala. 
Of course, that child who asks his question to his uncle on the night of Ashura, when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam gathers together all of his companions and he gathers together all of his family members, he begins to foretell them or give them a little bit of a glimpse into that which is going to take place the very next day on the 10th of Muharram. And as the Imam alayhi salam is narrating to them about that which will transpire on the day of Ashura, there's a small voice from the back of the tent that calls out, Ya am wa ana mimma yuqtal. Am I also going to die on the day? On, am I also going to die tomorrow, oh my uncle? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he looks to the back of the tent. And he sees this young boy who is 13 years old, according to most historical reports, others may say 16, who had likely not attained the age of puberty. And more than anything else, it's important to note that Qasim ibn al-Hasan was entrusted to Aba Abdullah al-Hussain in a way that he saw him as his own son. And if you take a look at the interactions even leading up to the day of Ashura, their interaction on the day of Ashura, what you're going to see is that same love that Imam al Hussein salam demonstrates to Ali al Akbar. He also demonstrates that to his nephew Qasim. So he asks him, he says, Ya am wa ana mimma yuqtal. Am I also going to die? And how is this father going to answer? that question to his child, to his nephew. This child who's an orphan, doesn't have a father, 13 years old. Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, he tries to pivot away from the question. So he calls out, he says, Ya Qasim, kayf al He states, oh Qasim, how do you see death? What is death to you? To which he responds with this famous line, Ya Am Ya Aba Abdullah Al Mawtu Ahla Min Al Asr. That in your way, O oh my master, Aba Abdullah, O oh my uncle, death is sweeter than honey. Look at the question, look at the response by the uncle, and look at the response by Qasa. That's the conviction. That's exactly what we want to see in our children. That demonstrates such incredible cultivation by Hassan, by Ali ibn Abi Talib, by the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, for them to raise a child like Qasim ibn al Hassan, alayhi salam, who we honor on a night like tonight. Of course, again, like we said before, the tragedy of Qasim is really difficult because of not only the way that it transpires, but because of that love and that attachment that Qasim ibn al-Hassan has to Aba Abdullah and vice versa. Which is why it's said that on the 10th of Muharram, all of the companions of Aba Abdullah al Hussein had been martyred. Ali and al-Akbar by this time had been martyred and many others from amongst Banu Hashim. Until it came to when Qasim ibn al-Hassan, 13 years old, he comes to his uncle, Aba Abdullah, and he says, Ya am Halli min Ruqsa. He says, Oh, my uncle, do I have permission from you today? You know what Imam al Hussein alayhi salam says? He says, Oh, Qasim, permission for what? What do you think? What are you asking me? He says, Oh, Aba Abdullah, let me go out and defend you. Let me go out and defend the message of my grandfather, Rasulullah. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, unlike his interaction for with Ali al Akbar, as we're going to mention in a couple of nights, he absolutely indefinitively rejects Qasim. He says, absolutely not. Please go back to your mother. There is no way you're going to go and fight. Qasim, alayhi salam, he returns back to his mother only for a few moments later to come back to him and says, oh, my uncle, Aba Abdullah, there is no one else. Look into the tents. There's no one else. Please let me go and defend you, oh, Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he doesn't have the courage to tell his nephew, yes, please go and fight. So you know what he does? According to the report, he embraces Qasim ibn al Hassan until they both fell unconscious. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on the Ashura, he falls unconscious twice. Firstly, when he sees Ali al Akbar leave the first time, and secondly, when Qasim alayhi salam comes to embrace him. It is said a few moments later, they get back up, they embrace one another. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is weeping. According 
according to one report, Qasim, he begins to embrace the feet of Aba Abdullah, begging him to say, please, oh my uncle, let me go out and fight. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he picks Qasim up. They go back into the tent of the women. It is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he takes a piece of cloth, a cloth that was worn by his brother, Imam al Mujtaba al Hassan. It is said that he takes that cloth and he cuts it in half. He wraps it around the waist of Qasim ibn al Hassan. Then he wraps around another piece of it around the head of Qasim to wear as a turban. Then he goes and he brings the armor of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. He brings a shield. He gives him a sword. And Qasim ibn al Hassan alayhi salam, he bids farewell to his aunt Zainab. He bids farewell to his mother Ramla. And at this moment, he begins to walk toward the plains of Karbala. He begins to walk to the middle of the battlefield. But let me ask you this question, oh my dear friends, that normally whenever we narrate the masa'ib of any other of the family members or companions of Imam al Hussein, we talk about how they get on top of the horse and they ride to the middle of the battlefield. Abd al Abbas rides to the river Euphrates. Ali al Akbar rides to the middle of the battlefield. One by one, they get on top of that horse and they fight valiantly. But when it comes to Qasim ibn al Hassan, we talk about the fact that he walks. I'll tell you why, because Qasim, like we said, is only 13 years old. And though on a normal occasion, he would be able to get on top of the horse, he's, he's carrying this heavy shield, wearing this heavy armor. This sword is so difficult for him to even pick up. He's just a child, so he can't get on top of the horse. So he begins to walk, not even run. He walks to the middle because of the weight of the armor. It is said that he goes out and he fights courageously until someone calls out, who is this child from Banu Hashim? He calls out his lines of poetry, فَأَنْ تَنْكِرُونِي فَأَنَا نَجْلُ الْحَسَنِ سِبْتُ النَّبِيَ الْمُصْطَفَىٰ الْمُؤْتَمَنِ هَذَا حُسَيْنٌ كَالْأَسِيرِ he says that if you do not know me, then know that I am the son of Hassan. I come from the progeny of the messenger of God. And this is my uncle Hussein, who you've made into a prisoner. He goes out, he fights 35 people. He, he goes out, he fights until he kills, according to a report, 35 people. At this moment, one of the members from the army of Amr ibn Sa'ad, he calls out to the army. He says, by God, if I'm not the one who kills this beautiful boy, then may the curse of all of the Arabs be upon me. Hamid ibn Muslim, he narrates something. He says that when Qasim left the tent of Aba Abdullah, I noticed one thing so unique about this beautiful child. That was that his left slipper was broken. But Qasim was so engrossed in battle. He was so engrossed in feeling the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that that didn't bother him. So he would go out and he would struggle in the way of his grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib at Badr and at Uhud and at Khandak and at Khaybar and at Hunayn until that man, he comes and he start, starts to strike Qasim. At this moment, Omar ibn Saadi calls out that this is the grandson of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Make sure you don't fight him one to one. So they all began to surround this one child, one man strikes him from the right, another man strikes him from that left. That same man who came and uttered those words, he struck Qasim on top of the head. At that moment, Qasim alayhi salam, he bent down to fix his slipper and another man came and struck him with a dagger. He begins to call out, Ya am alayka min salam. Oh, my uncle, please come and help me. My last farewell upon you. It is said that at this moment, Abu Abdullah al Hussein, he begins to run, he begins to fly to the middle of the battlefield. He knows that this is his. His, his entrusted son, his nephew Qasim, he begins to run to the middle of the battlefield until finally he embraces Qasim. But at that point, he sees his nephew struggling for life, gasping for air. You know what happens? It is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he tries to pick up the body of Qasim and Qasim looks toward his uncle Abu Abdullah as he's gasping for air. He says, oh, my uncle Abu Abdullah. He says, what's wrong with me? Imam al Hussein says, what's wrong Qasim? He says, I can't feel my legs at this moment. Imam and Hussein looks down only to see that his legs have been dismembered from his waist. So he holds Qasim close to his chest. He tries to lift it, but he can't lift his body. So he begins to drag his body back toward the tent. Only a few moments later, the most tragic scene. I want you to imagine it. I want you to imagine Imam and Hussein on the day of Ashura. It is said that he picks up that body and he drags that body of Qasim and he places it behind the tent and he's weeping loudly, only a matter of 
moments takes place and Zainab alayhi salam, she exits the tent and she says, oh my brother Abu Abdullah, what's wrong with you? She sees Imam al Hussein alayhi salam sitting near the body of Ali al Akbar, seeing, sitting near the body of Qasim, crying and screaming and calling out, inna lillah wa inna ilayka raji'un. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the grief in our hearts to allow for these hearts to be instilled with the love of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad. And to grant us a life that resembles the life of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad. And to grant us a death that resembles the death of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to never separate us from Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify these hearts of ours and to forgive our sins and transgressions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq. I could ask you all to please recite one recitation of Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha, but before that, one salawat ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salawat ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Bismillah.